This episode is supported by Skillshare. What kind of mathematical function deserves the nickname the Devil's Staircase? Before we get to Cantor's function, aka the Devil's Staircase, let's start with the Cantor set. A set is just a collection of numbers, but the Cantor set, named after Georg Cantor, is a particularly weird collection. Let's construct the Cantor set in stages. Stage zero is the closed interval zero to one. The fact that it's closed, indicated with square brackets, means that the interval includes the endpoints zero and one. In stage one, remove the middle third, the open interval one third to two thirds. That leaves us with zero to one third and two thirds to one. In stage two, we're gonna remove the middle third from each of those two pieces. So we remove one ninth to two ninths and seven ninths to eight ninths. This leaves us with four pieces, zero to one ninth, two ninths to one third, two thirds to seven ninths and eight ninths to one. In stage three, we remove the middle third from each of these, which leaves us with eight intervals of size 1 27th. And then we keep doing this on and on. The collection of points that are left after infinitely many stages is known as the Cantor set. But are there any points left? We just kept removing middle thirds over and over again. Maybe we removed everything. Amazingly, we didn't. There are still plenty of points left after infinitely many stages. And if we look at the construction of the Cantor set with a new perspective, by viewing the numbers in base three, we'll be able to see exactly which points remain. For this construction, we'll have to use base three numbers. Pick a point between zero and one and mark it with an X. In base 10, we'd label this point 0 0.4273, which means it has four tenths plus two hundredths plus seven thousandth plus three ten thousandths. It's also a recipe for how to zoom in on it. Divide the interval into 10 pieces, then look at the part between the fourth and the fifth mark, between four tenths and five tenths. Divide that into 10 pieces, then look at the part between the second and third mark, between 0 0.42 and 0 0.43. You can keep zooming in dividing by tenths. Well, the same thing works in base three. The same point labeled in base three is 0 0.10211211. That means it's 1 third plus 0 ninths plus 2 27ths plus 181st and so on. Instead of powers of 10, the decimal places are powers of three. But interpreting it as a recipe for how to zoom in still works. Divide the interval into three pieces, then look between the first and the second mark, between 1 third and 2 thirds. Divide that into three pieces, then look between the zeroth and first mark, between 0 0.10 and 0 0.11. Again, you can keep zooming in that way and you'll eventually find the point. Back to the Cantor set. Let's look at the set in base three as we go through the stages of the construction of the Cantor set. At stage zero, we have the whole interval. At stage one, we remove the middle third, which are all the numbers with a one in the first place after the decimal. At stage two, we remove the next middle thirds, which are all the numbers with a one in the second place after the decimal. At stage three, we remove all the numbers with a one in the third place after the decimal. So what remains after infinitely many stages, the Cantor set, is exactly all the points whose base three expansion contains no ones. Not only is the Cantor set not empty, it contains tons and tons of points, and they're easy to write down in base three. Notice that the Cantor set is a fractal, or self-similar, in the sense that you can zoom in on it and it will look exactly like the whole set. How big is the Cantor set? How many numbers are in it? The weird part about the Cantor set is that it fits one mathematical definition of being big and another mathematical definition of being small. Here's the sense in which it's big. The Cantor set is uncountable. 
Remember from our episode, A Hierarchy of Infinities, that there's a smallest infinity, countable, and bigger infinities, uncountable. Here's your challenge problem for the day. Give a proof of the uncountability of the Cantor set. Show that it's not the smallest infinity. In this sense, it's just as big as the interval we extracted it from. They're both uncountable. But here's the sense in which the Cantor set is small. It has length zero. The mathematical formalization of your intuitive notion of length is called the one-dimensional Lebesgue measure. But right now, I'll just call it length. Let's look at the length of the Cantor set in stages. At stage zero, it's the interval zero to one. So it has length one. At each stage after this, we remove one third of the previous set, leaving a set that is two thirds the length. So at stage one, the set has length two thirds. At stage two, the set is two thirds the length of that set. So it has length two thirds times two thirds, or four ninths. The set is always two thirds the length of the previous set. Continuing this, at stage n, the set has length two thirds to the n. The Cantor set is produced after infinitely many stages. So the length of the Cantor set is the limit as n goes to infinity of two thirds to the n, which is zero. Basically, the Cantor set is weird. It's uncountably big, but has zero length. It actually has a ton of other weird properties, several other episodes worth. But for now, let's talk about the Cantor function, also known as the devil's staircase. Describing the Cantor function, which is a function on the interval zero one, is a lot like describing the Cantor set. We build it in stages. At stage zero, the function is just a line extending from zero to one. The function at stage one has a flat line at height one half for the middle third between one third and two thirds and two diagonal lines to fill it in. Again, the function starts at zero and ends at one. At stage two, we add two more flat lines, one at height one quarter from one ninth to two ninths and one at height three quarters from seven ninths to eight ninths. Notice that these two flat lines are the middle third of the diagonal segments from stage one. And now we add in diagonal lines to fill it in, starting at zero and ending at one. At stage three, we add in four more flat lines like this. For each diagonal line in the previous stage, we replace its middle third with a flat line at the midpoint of its height, then fill in the remainder with diagonal lines. Then you just keep doing this. The Cantor function is the function you end up with after infinitely many stages. We've broken up all the diagonal lines until they're infinitesimal, and we're left with all these flat line segments. Much like the Cantor set, many of the properties of the Cantor function seem in tension with each other. The Cantor function starts at zero and ends at one, so it has a vertical increase of one unit. But the function is flat, that is, it has zero slope, at every point besides the points in the Cantor set. The Cantor set has zero length, so all the points that are not in the Cantor set must have length one. So at almost every point, all the ones that are not in the Cantor set, the function is simply moving horizontally. It's making no vertical progress, but still it moves vertically by one unit. So all the vertical movement of the Cantor function happens at the points in the Cantor set. If you asked me to draw a function on the interval zero one that has zero slope, except at some discrete points and moves vertically one unit, I would probably draw something like this or this. This is basically like drawing a staircase. It needs to be flat so things don't roll off, but it also needs to make vertical leaps at certain points so we can actually climb upward. But staircases are not continuous functions. Continuous functions, which are intuitively functions you can draw without lifting your pen off the paper, cannot have vertical leaps like this. So is it possible to draw a continuous staircase? Yes, the devil's staircase. The Cantor function is a continuous function. It does not have any vertical leaps. 
all of its vertical motion is contained within the tiny zero-length canter set, but it still manages to climb up one unit without ever making a vertical leap. It's just kind of bizarre. One last oddity of the canter function. How long is the curve defined by the graph of the canter function? A curve that moves from 0, 0 to 1, 1 by moving directly horizontally and then directly vertically has length 2. A curve that moves from 0, 0 to 1, 1 by moving in a diagonal straight line has length square root of 2. What about the Cantor function? The Cantor function feels like a mix of these, but it turns out it has length 2. So, the Devil's Staircase moves one unit vertically, despite having zero slope almost everywhere, at every point besides the Cantor set, and being continuous. All the interesting non-flat points of this crazy function form the Cantor set, a fractal with uncountably many points but zero length. They're quite the unusual mathematical objects. Don't forget to answer the challenge question. See you next time. I'd like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this episode. Skillshare is an online learning community with classes in design, business, photography, and more. Premium membership includes unlimited access to classes and is available starting at $10 a month. You'll be able to learn from anywhere by downloading the Android or iPhone app. I just watched one on how to brew the perfect cup of coffee, a necessary skill for any mathematician. To get a two-month free trial and help support our show, click on the link in the description or go to Skillshare.com and use the promo code InfiniteSeries at checkout. There's a new PBS Digital Studios show, even newer than this show, called Above the Noise, that takes a closer look at the science floating around the news. The expert hosts, Miles and Shireen, do the research to help you unpack the facts from the noise. As a science writer, I especially liked their episode outlining four tips to spot bad science reporting. We've linked to their channel in the description. Go check it out. There were great comments on the topology episode. But first, there were so many fun submissions for the topology challenge that I wanted to show you more than one of them. It was really hard to pick a winner, but here it is. From Justin Veland, these images show the transition from a sphere with five spokes taken out of the center to a four-hold torus. Speaking of great submissions, I want to say a huge thanks to Slothman86 on Twitter for the fantastic picture of Matt and me that was featured in the last episode. And finally, here's something I should have been more precise about, something many of you pointed out. There are two different types of morphing going on. The first is called homeomorphism. That's generally what it means for two topological shapes to be the same, like the coffee cup and donut. The intuition is that you can change one into the other without tearing or gluing. But when we were comparing loops, we were using a different sense of morph. And in this sense, you are allowed to contract things to a point. Thanks for clarifying that in the comments.